As you know, I'm uh, swapping the original switches that came with the Ephus, which are these uh, small tactile black ones. Uh, one of these. And I'm fitting uh, these tactile switches, which uh, are illuminated so that when the button is in front of it, the, uh, the writing will be illuminated uh, when the backlighting is on. Uh, there's no modification necessary to the pre-drilled holes. Uh, the only thing we have got to do is drill two extra holes for the legs of the LED to poke through. So where we've got the holes there, uh, exactly in line with those holes and dead center of them, we have to drill another one. You can see I've put some dots with a red pen here, just as a guide. I'm uh, just simply gonna do that with a, a one mil drill bit on a Dremel. Just like that. So it now gives us six holes per switch. Uh, in an earlier segment, I was hoping to nick the bulbs out of these 12 mil greens because I, I've got some left over from the MCP build. Um, but I took one apart and discovered that the bulbs are actually green, um, so I can't use them. I've got one here somewhere. Is this the one? Yeah, there we go. Look, it's a green light. So luckily I had seven whites left over. So I've got no room for error. Uh, no room for error. Uh, because I need seven. Um, let me just get rid of some of this junk. If you watch my FMC video, you'll know how I took these apart, but just to recap, so these are the white 12 mil illuminated tactile switches. Just get some snips and just take them four little black lugs off the corners. And then you should be able to just pull the switch apart so we don't need the bottom part. The only bit we're interested in is the bulb. We'll just pull that part off. And there's the bulb. So with these, you can pull and move the legs about. see nice bright white light uh, the the legs have got I really don't know if I'll be able to show you this oh here we go you can see some yellow paint on one of the legs that shows the uh, negative side of the LED so if I put that on the battery negative side there you go you can see it lights up uh, and then the next job is to just simply slot the legs into one of our switches. It's a bit fiddly. I'm trying to get them both to line up. Sorry, I'm not even doing this on camera, am I? There we go. And then I just use a screwdriver small screwdriver just to push the LED down into the slot. There we go. And then finally what I do is just get some pliers and give the legs a gentle pull just to make sure everything is 
straight and the LED is fully seated. And that's it and then that should drop into a newly drilled hole. straighten out one of the pins on the switch. There we go. There we go, so now we have an illuminated six mil tactile switch and you can see that the pins on the back poke through ample enough to solder so we can fit the switch in place now and still get to the pins to solder them when we need to at a later date. So that's what I'm going to do, another six to go uh, and that will be my illuminated switches ready and these lights are going to come on with the backlighting for the EFIS and the MCP and the other EFIS. So these are three volt LEDs, so I'm gonna be wiring them exactly as I did on the FMC uh, in groups of four. And then there'll be a group of three with a suitable resistor. Okay, so uh, after the disaster of trying to drill one of these with that little Dremel press thing, um, I decided to uh, get myself a proper pillar drill. Uh, it turned up this afternoon and I've put it together, checked it all out and uh, everything seems to be working square and straight. Um, so what I've done is I've set it up exactly as we had it before, uh, the only be difference being that I've G clamp the vise to the plate uh, on the drill this time so nothing can move. So exactly the same as we did before, we're gonna um, drill through the first layer uh, and then stop drilling, take this out and take it apart and then continue the drilling. So here's take two uh, and hopefully it goes a bit more to plan this time, but we shall see. Okay, so I'm through. Uh, I have to take the drill bit out, otherwise I can't um, get the rotary out. Okay, so finger stabbing time. Okay, so cupping it again because of the ball bearings and the springs. There we 
go. There's one ball bearing. There's the other. And let me just dig out the spring. There we go, so you can see where the drilling has started down the centre of the shaft there. So we'll now go back to the oops, wrong one. There we go. So again, keeping the flat uh, away from the from the collets. So we'll have the flat between the collets and just allowing a bit of space for us to come through the bottom of the shaft. Uh, I checked, checked the drill out with one of these um, angle gauges uh, and I found the plate to be 0 0.01 degrees out from the shaft so I mean to me that's pretty good okay so here we go Look at that, absolutely dead center. Just goes to show what, uh, what a difference a suitable machine can, um, can do with the workpiece. Because my setup was no different um, to how it was on the Dremel, but you can see a difference in the quality. Here's my three mil brass rod. So first thing we need to do is cut the spring in half. And what I'm gonna do this time is I'm not gonna remove a piece of the spring just to see what difference that makes. So we'll put, put the shaft in first. Look at that. And I'm putting the cut end of the spring in first. So we've got the the manufactured edge. Just bring my mic closer, bear with me. Oh. 
Uh, just so we've got the manufactured edge of the spring for the ball bearing to sit in. Let's poke the spring. Oops. Okay, let's drop the uh, ball bearing in that slot. You can see it there. And then use a blunt ended object just to push it all the way in. At the same time, just pushing everything down. So now we're gonna rotate it until the other hole lines up with the slot and then just slightly push it back so we can see the spring. Drop the other ball bearing in. Like that. And then push that home at the same time as pushing down. There we go, all locked into place. Yeah, I can I can feel it's slightly harder to turn uh, when leaving the the springs at full length, but I think that would be okay once we've got a knob on. So I don't think there's any need to cut the spring shorter to make up for the thickness of the uh, the rod. So lining the. Uh, little dimple thing up with the slot on the casing and then pushing it all back together and there we go so oh yeah it's got a very very definite clip point there Just see if I've got a spare knob just to put on there. Oh yeah, that's absolutely fine. Knob slipping a little bit, it's only a rubber. Yeah, I think that'd be all right. It's slightly stiffer than what it would be uh, if you cut the spring, but I'm, I'm okay with that. I think this one fits, nope. So there we go anyway, a successful drill. Try and get it in focus, there we go. So a successful drill straight down the center of the shaft. Uh, and this is one of the flat edged uh, shafts as well. So this one is, uh, this is a 45 degree rotary 
and so far the way I can tell is the 45s have got pins missing uh, if it's a 30 like this one then it has all the pins there I don't know if that's uh, a true way to tell but it's just what I've noticed whenever you see 45 degree rotaries on eBay although they don't always say whether they're 30 or 45 you can tell by the missing pins they seem to have two, one missing, two, one missing, two, one missing whereas the 30s have all the pins in place so that's the uh, this is one that I practiced drilled before doing the one that we showed you so that's both of them now drilled absolutely dead center uh, and this is going to be for the top part of the ephus um, which will incorporate uh, the outer switch for two positions for the barrow and uh, I'm just looking for ephus and I can't find it ah there it is So that would be these two here uh, for the minimums and barrow. Uh, so that would be a two position outer switch for radio and barrow on this side on the minimums. Then there'll be a, a knob for the encoder for changing the minimums, which will go through and connect at the back here to one of these so that's a rotary encoder that also incorporates a push button and I think the push button on this is quite possibly for reset so reset it back to zero so and you can see that I've uh, made this little back plate for my ethos uh, so all I've done is I've fitted some extensions um, these are just nylon ones they seem plenty strong enough uh, and this plate is a sh I got a sheet of G10 uh, left over from my modeling days um, it's very very hard um, I don't know it's like a epoxy sheet or something like that but really really tough uh, easy to cut and easy to drill, but strength is just no bend in it at all. And that's me putting a fair bit of pressure on it and it's just barely moving. Certainly a lot stronger than uh, the Perspex panels. Um, so all I done was um, I took the face plate off and I drew round it onto my sheet of this, which comes in an A4 sheet. Uh, and then I marked, drew the, the four holes and these two holes here and those two holes there uh, and then drilled them out. Uh, obviously the top ones are going to be for the rotary encoders to slot in there like that. Uh, I may have to bring this plate back further, uh, I won't know until I get my rotaries fitted back in the front uh, of my ethos uh, and you can see with the the ones we drilled the other day that's that are off center uh, I'm probably gonna swap these out for some new ones that I've bought uh, and drill them again because I'm just not happy with it being that far off center so now I know I've got a decent setup to do it uh, it's gonna take me five minutes just to re-drill two more uh, so that's I drilled four holes there for the uh, one of the push buttons with the caps on so what I plan to do is um, probably epoxy the brass rod to the cap uh, and then the cap will lock onto the switch when I put this backboard in place and then it's just a case of uh, slightly enlarging the hole on um, these are Kyle Clark's Ephus knobs that I've printed uh, so that should 
it's not going to fit. I need to enlarge the hole just a tad. But anyway, that will go on there like that. Uh, and then I'm going to laser cut a button to go in the front there. So it's just a case of trimming this brass rod to length. Uh, obviously allowing enough behind the cap for it to move slightly to press the button. I mean, you can hear that that's working absolutely fine. So of course these ones uh, just incorporate a push button. There's no uh, turning involved because there's no rotary encoder. It's only the, the top two that have the rotary encoder and the push button. So that's where I am at the moment. I haven't had uh, much chance this week to get on with it because uh, I've been looking after my daughter, but uh, I'm now going to uh, drill the other two encoders out and hopefully get them fitted and then we'll come back. Uh, I think what I'm going to have to do is print uh, 3D print some sort of converter so uh, that'll be a something with a, a 3 mil hole in it on one end and then a D-shaped converter on the other so I can slide it onto this shaft and then glue uh, the, the, the rod in the other end so it converts it from a 3 mil round bar to a D-shaped 6 mil So that's my plan. Sorry to ramble on a bit. I just wanted to make sure that I caught up on everything that I've been doing while waiting for this drill to turn up. Uh, I will just show you the drill. Uh, I looked on uh, Amazon. I mean, I'm, I do like my tools. I am a tool guy, so I do normally try and get the best. But if it's something that I really don't use very often, you know, I don't want to spend an out a huge amount of money. Uh, but I, I looked at lots of different brands uh, on Amazon and uh, reading the reviews everybody was saying about the same problems with holes being oval instead of round and lots of vibration in the shaft etc and bad depth uh, stops that break and don't work. Uh, and, and I mean, this was the problem I had with every single drill I looked at on Amazon. I know you can't fully trust other people's reviews, but there was so many bad reviews that I couldn't help myself. But, you know, I think I need to look elsewhere. But I found this website called Rutlands. Um, and they, they this is the only drill they seem to do, but it certainly looked a solid bit of kit uh, compared to what I've been looking at. And oh, excuse me a second, just when you don't want a phone call. Okay, we're back. Sorry about that. It's a phone call just when you when you don't want it. But uh, I don't know where I got to. Uh, I found this company called Rutlands, and uh, this is the only drill they do. But to me, it looked a fairly solid bit of kit. Um, the the pillar drill that I got rid of was a Clark metal worker and and that was an absolute colossal beast. Uh, I didn't want anything that big, but it seemed seemed to me like you had to go that big to get any sort of quality. Uh, until I saw this one, um, it's, it's certainly I, I had a, a cheap B and Q pillar drill in the past and. I literally used it once and threw it in the shed, it was that rubbish. Uh, but this one, I, I do actually quite like it. Now you've got a depth stop on here, so you, if, I, if I wanted to go 10mm deep, you just lock it there. And then it will only let you go 10mm deep. Um, so that's quite a neat idea. Uh, a lot of the, the drills seem to have like a, a threaded rod up this side and you have to fiddle about rotating nuts to, to get the depth set rather than just doing this. So this was quite neat. Uh, it's got adjustable rotor. Rotor. Adjustable motor uh, for your belt tension. And in the top you've got uh, belts in there for adjusting the speed. Uh, I've just left it on the default speed, which is the middle one by the look of it. 
So that's about the, about the speed that I'll be using. And literally, it took me and my two year old daughter uh, about 10 minutes just to get it all together. So yeah, it's, I can recommend it from what I've seen of it so far. Uh, obviously you don't get the vice with it, this is my own one. Um, but this is a four, a four inch vice. Uh, this is too big to lock on to the slots in the plate here. So you'd have to get uh, possibly a th three inch vice maybe. Uh, I don't know, but the, these holes won't line up with them ones, but it's not a problem. I just G clamp it down. So, there you go, you can take up to a 16 mil drill. There you go, there's my mini review. Uh, obviously 240 volt as well, rather than 110. Okay, see you in the next bit. Okay, back again, still playing with these rotaries. Um, this is gonna be version three of uh, how I'm gonna do these. Uh, this is the one I've just finished uh, adapting and you'll notice how smooth the shaft is through the rotary I and mean, it literally drops straight through. Uh, and you're also probably wondering why, how, how I'm um, managing to put the shaft in and take it out without the springs closing up together. Well, that's the model I've just done uh, and it's absolutely amazing. I mean, that's going to be no issues pressing uh, the push button via the shaft and the rotary encoder is going to be so smooth. So I'm going to show you what I've done uh, to allow that to happen. Uh, so I've just taken, this is one that um, we drilled on camera earlier. So I've just taken it apart again. And what I've got here is a piece of three mil wooden dowel. Uh, this is just a, like a cocktail stick type thing, a uh, big one. Uh, and what you're gonna need to do is cut a, a seven mil piece of this dowel. Um, try and get the ends as square as possible. So what I'm using is these scissor snips. So the first thing I'm gonna do is just sand uh, the end nice and square. You could all cut this on a bandsaw or with a knife or however you want really, but so now I'm going to mark a seven mil piece. And what you're also going to want to do is put a mark at three and a half mil. which is obviously the center of the seven mil. So I'm just gonna snip this off. I'm gonna snip it slightly longer than I need so I can sand it square afterwards. Okay, so there's our seven mil piece with a mark at three and a half mil in the center. What we're now gonna do is take uh, the part that we drilled, so that's the part where the springs go in, and we're gonna slide this dowel in the spring hole. So our mark is pointing at the top. And then we're gonna push it through until our mark is in the center of our hole. So we know that the dowel is central uh, 
and try and rotate the dial a bit because I can't see my mark. Right, there we go, I've got my mark. You probably can't see that, but I can see my mark is now in the center of that hole. So now what I'm gonna do is get this thin super glue and run it down in that hole and in the ends where the springs go. So what we're doing is gluing that dowel in place. I know this sounds a crazy idea, but trust me, it works so well. Just give that a few seconds for the glue to dry. So now you can see, possibly, uh, try and focus. Uh, there's not quite enough light. Uh, you can see in there you, that I've, the dowel is in there. Yeah, and now glued in place. So now what we're gonna do is go back to the pillar drill and we're gonna run the drill down so that we re... What we're looking to do is now drill out the middle of that dowel with a three mil hole. So all it will leave is two two mil pieces of that dowel in the spring shaft. So we'll go back to the drill. which I haven't got my camera set up for because I'm always unprepared. So I'll just pop the shaft in there like that and then a three mil drill bit. And then we'll just run that through. Nice and slow. So now we've drilled out the center of that dowel and you might be able to see that we've still got our pieces in there. So there is literally two mil of dowel. Uh, what I'm gonna do is just run the file through just to clean up that drilled edge of the wood. Okay, so now we should have, no, not quite, need to clean up the edge a bit more. There we go. Lovely and smooth. Now, With the springs, you're going to have to experiment with length. I mean, I've just kind of got it fixed to my eye, really, of how long it needs to be. Obviously, it needs to be shorter than what we were cutting it before. And I suggest you get some... If you're going to be doing this, uh, get yourself a little pack of three mil springs 
and three more wall bearings because trust me you're gonna lose them so now basically what our spring is doing is resting against that two mil piece of dowel rather than pushing on our brass rod um, because obviously the end of the spring is quite sharp I found that it was grinding on this rod and uh, it wasn't smooth to push the rod through uh, and make contact with our push button or our encoder or anything okay so that's one bit of spring in place and just for the record I'll measure roughly what I'm cutting So it's about three and a half mil of spring, roughly. I mean, it's best to start long because you can always take it out and cut a bit more off. I mean, it's even if the spring is long, it's going to work okay. It's just going to be a bit stiff to turn and you can slowly cut bits off until you get it about how you want it. Okay, let's get the ball bearings in place. That's one in. I can feel that that's possibly a little bit stiff. Oh no, that's okay. Probably if I took another half a mil off, so what did I say it was three and a half, uh, about three mil of spring. That's nice and clicky. Uh, and you'll notice now that the, uh, the end of that shaft is a bit bent. If we can pop our cap on. Oh, that is beautiful. Oh, that's the bent one. This could be that one. This is a straight one. Alright, that's what we want. So, that is absolutely perfect. I'm really happy uh, with how smooth everything is. So, that's that's the way I'm going to be now going back to do, do all the ones uh, that I've already drilled out. So there you go, version three is the good version. Hello again, it's uh, been a couple of days since the last uh, video I did and you can see that I've progressed a bit with the EFIS. Uh, so I'm just gonna talk you through where we're at at the moment. Uh, you can see that I've got the four rotary switches now fitted, uh, these are bolted and hot glued in just to make sure they stay in place and you can also see that I've made this back panel out of G10 and fitted 
two rotary encoders with push button at the top here and they've just got the D-shaped shaft on them uh, and what I've done is I've 3D printed uh, a D-shaft to 3mm th hole uh, sort of converter so there's a 3mm hole in this end to take the end of our shaft uh, and that runs to, to about halfway and then from halfway backwards is a D-shaped hole to fit on our rotary encoder so once everything is fitted up uh, these will be glued to the rotary and the shaft will be glued inside the hole so that sets everything in place uh, the reason for this spring at the back here uh, it's not really necessary uh, but what I think if I was to do when I do the first officer side the hole uh, which is through this back plate I think I'll probably file it out to be slightly elongated left to right uh, and what that will allow me to do is to fit the shaft through and then move the encoder around to get everything absolutely center before then tightening the nut um, because where my shaft comes through I don't know if you can see that is I don't know 0.2 of a mil out I mean if I push it it will go in there we go it's just popped in but that was enough to give a bit of a bind so that when you press the button it wouldn't spring back to place uh, by the time this outer shaft was on so all that spring is doing is giving it a bit more a bit more just to push the button back it's still very easy to press but like I said next time I think I'll elongate that back hole a bit and allow me to move the rotary dead center but this this works pretty well uh, didn't didn't have the same problem on the buttons down the bottom here um, so that would be the one that rotates uh, the shaft uh, I can't show you the outer knob at the minute because I've just clear lacquered it and it's drying. <clears throat> um, the the button, this one here is what I cut on my laser cutter and that's glued in place because that will just turn with the whole shaft and then the push button is the whole part moving. So same, exactly the same on this side. And the bottom buttons I can't show you either because they're clear lacquered and they're drying at the minute. Uh, but obviously the, the knob will go on first and this will go inside. And what will happen is the metal shaft will glue to this button so that the traffic message stays straight while the shaft rotates around it while the knob rotates around it but you can see that one's got a lovely press on it um what else have i done since i've got all my buttons fitted so apart from waiting for the lacquer to dry uh, and fitting the knobs on and gluing them in place like I said there's just the wiring to go uh, on the captain's ethos the FPV and meters buttons uh, are on those two switches there uh, I can't remember if I mentioned in the other video whether I'd done I mentioned that I'd done the backlighting, but the backlighting's all in place. Um, there's three strips in total, so I've got one running along the very top to light up these. Uh, then I've got a strip in the middle to light the top, and then I've got a strip running along the bottom 
to like the rest of that ring and the ADF2 and ADF1 and obviously the buttons have got their own backlighting in the buttons themselves so they'll all be wired together to come on at the same time so that's the latest update on the EFIS. Now here's just a little interesting thing that I found when I was building the MCP. If you're using SimVim, um, what you must do uh, if you're using SimVim with a multiplexer anyway, uh, I'm not sure if it's the same if you're not using a multiplexer. Uh, if you're assigning a rotary switch, uh, so any of these four, they're all rotary switches. Um, we'll take this one for example so it's a four position rotary uh, when you wire it up to your multiplexer you must use four pins in a row so you can't jump around on the multiplexer with these four connections because in SimVim uh, you only select the first pin that this rotary is connected to so say if it was wired to pin 10 on the multiplexer it will automatically simvim will automatically assign 11 12 and 13 as the next part of the switch so 10 11 12 13 you don't have to assign all four positions of the switch it automatically follows on with the next three after the one you selected uh, so for this one for instance this is an 8 position rotary uh, say if it was connected you, you wired the 5 to pin 1 it would then automatically select the next 7 uh, in the row so that would be pin 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and 8 uh, I made this mistake with the uh, <coughs> MCP um, basically because I, I used three multiplexers I had uh, one pin left on one of the multiplexers so I wired the first um, position of one of my rotaries to that last pin and then the next three were the start of a new multiplexer and when I came to assign it in SimVim I couldn't do it because it has to have four in a row if it's a four position rotary. I hope that kind of clears it up. Uh, I'll try to explain it the best way I can. I hope that helps.